Dr. Grace Lorden, the founding director of the Inclusion Initiative at the London School of Economics, states that firms' focus should be on policies that allow all workers to thrive in terms of being both productive and happy at work. She emphasizes that flexibility is one of these policies. The findings of the Women in Banking and Finance Accelerating Change Together research program suggests that heightened flexibility is correlated with marginally improved productivity, and both men and women benefit from this heightened flexibility. COVID has forced all companies into changes in working practices at a pace that would have been inconceivable only a few years ago. And while we see positive impacts of this in the workplace, are firms truly willing to adopt flexible ways of working three years hence? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Divya Sharma, the DEI lead at Invesco for the EMEA region. I also co-chair the Smart Working Work Stream along with Gareth here. Um, and I welcome you to our second panel of the day, Flex, the Forgotten Element of Smart Working, where I and my lovely panelists here will discuss the opportunities and barriers to this within our industry. So let's start with an introduction from our panelists. Emma. Hello. Um, my name is Emma Smith. I'm a property underwriter at Atrium Syndicate. I've worked in the insurance market for 20 years um, and I've spent my last 10 years with Atrium. We're delighted to have the opportunity to speak here today um, and be a part of this panel. For those of you that don't know Atrium, which is probably most of you, I would imagine, um, we're an insurance underwriting business in Lloyds of London what I like to call actually the home of insurance. Um, hopefully more of you have heard of Lloyd's and that we're not the bank, we're the part of the um, specialist insurance market at Lloyd's. I'm gonna pass you over to my best friend at work <laughs> and job share um, and Victor, you can introduce yourself. Hi everybody, my name is Victoria Gobi. As Emma alluded to, we both work in the insurance sector in a syndicate called Atrium. We uh, have the, well, the opportunity, we've organized ourselves a job share, which we're extremely proud of, um, very unusual in our industry, but we'll talk about that a bit later. I've been in the insurance sector for nearly 28 years, of which 21 years at Atrium. Um, afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Deb Zingham. I'm an occupational psychologist and also the EMEA director at an organisation called How Do You Do It? Um, I sit on the uh, work stream for smart working within the diversity project and actually was one of the co-authors of that manager guide that you saw earlier that Gareth puts up on the screen. Hi everyone, um, I'm Katie Simons and I'm the Talent Acquisition Manager for EMEA at Morningstar. Um, I've only been there two years, well over two years now, and I also drive a lot of our DNI initiatives specifically around female career progression, um, and I actually work compressed hours, so I finish at 12 on a Friday. And I'm Alan Morahan, I'm Chief Commercial Officer of Punta South All Aspire. We're an employee benefit consultancy business within a larger group, Punta South All Group. Um, I've been with the business, but through Tupi um, arrangements for the last 29 and a half years. Um, and as you probably can tell from um, looking at me, I'm in the transition into retirement. Thank you. Let's start with a very basic understanding of what flexible working is. There is an industry-wide misconception that it's either working from home or working in the office. So the previous panel spoke a lot about statistics related to hybrid working and the advantages and disadvantages of that. Uh, can we think about you know, how hybrid working can actually benefit everyone and not just parents and carers, as is the misconception? Uh, Debs, maybe I can start with you. You've obviously done a lot of research um, in this space. What are your thoughts on this? Thanks, Debbie. Um, so, well, let's start off with that broader definition. And I think it was it's really useful to have sort of followed on from that earlier panel. Um, that, the focus there was very much around hybrid working. When we talk, however, about flexible working, it is a much broader definition. And I think what's happened recently with all the focus on hybrid working, there's been a conflation. Um, so people are starting to think, oh, if we do hybrid working, then we do we offer flexible work options. Now, if we think about the original definition of flexible working, and that's where at the diversity project, we refer to that as smart working within the industry. So when we're thinking about flexible working more broadly, we're actually thinking about the amount of time we work, the timing of when we work, as well as the location. 
And obviously hybrid absolutely falls into that location piece. But when we think about the amount of work we do, we're also considering things like reduced hours or part-time working. When we think about the timing of when we work, we're thinking about things like compressed hours. We're also thinking about uh, maybe flexible start and finish times and so on. We might also be thinking about things like sabbaticals. So there's a much, much broader uh, definition when we're actually talking about flexible working as a whole. And that's why today on the panel, we've got some really very varied examples of how flexible working is working within this industry. The second bit, if I can touch on that about the parents and carers, um, Personally, I'd say that's quite an outdated um, way of defining, uh, thinking about the target audience that are most interested in flexible working. Certainly, I think, you know, five, ten years ago, we could have looked in our organisations and we probably would have recognised that most people who were doing a form of flexible working, it was probably typically part time working and it was probably mostly women and they were mostly mothers. Now, I think we can see that the data is showing us that there are many more demographics that are interested in flexible working. So as well as those people who have a parenting or caring responsibility, they are, you know, up to often it's cited around 55% of our workforce population. But we've also got other dem demographics that are interested in flexible working. So we've alluded to it in the earlier panel, the older generation. So people with great expertise um, and experience within our organisations, but they are looking as a demographic to work for longer but they are looking to transition out of the workforce. And therefore, there are certain types of flexibility that are incredibly appealing for them to stay inside the workforce. We can also look, though, at the other end of the spectrum as such, so the Gen Z and the Millennials. Now, by 2025, that's going to be 75% of our workforce. So this is not a demographic that we want to ignore. And survey after survey, they are citing that flexibility is right up there at the top of their sort of shopping list when they think about, well, which industry do I want to go and work in and what type of role or organisation am I attracted to? So they are really critical when, when thinking about actually what our workplace proposition is for other people if we're thinking about attracting the brightest and the best. Now, those are three very large demographics in our workforce. But then I think you've got some intersectionality, some sub sort of groups that span across those. And that would include, pe could include people that have got maybe uh, physical or mental health challenges, that actually that flexibility is crucial for people actually maybe with neurodiversity, for people with disability. We're talking about some subgroups who actually having flexibility allows them access into the job market. And again, the panel earlier talked about the huge benefits for an employer if you are able to attract from that much, much broader talent pool. You are able to get the brightest and the best. We know also flexible working attracts things like far lower absenteeism. It also, there's greater engagement. We see higher job satisfaction, better discretionary effort from those employers who have flexibility. So there's a number of really compelling arguments for you as an employer to be really considering that much broader flexible working option. Victoria, Absolutely. You talked about the misconception of flexible working about just being either from home or in the office. And it's so interesting listening to the last panel, panel uh, how that was touched upon. I think that's such an old fashioned viewpoint that you're either at home or in the office. And if you're not in the office, you're not working. And being in the insurance sector before COVID, I know there's been touched on a lot. It literally changed overnight. Uh, if you weren't at your desk, or more specifically in the Lloyd's floor trading, you just weren't working. And it's, it's taken so long to get away from that. Um, so I think now it looks very different from you were saying. You've got flexible working looks so different to so many people. And you've obviously got the compressed hours, the part time, the job share. Which for, for our role as senior underwriters, to have that op option of working and knowing that someone else was doing your job when you weren't is so important. And it, again, touching back on one of the previous panels, in 2009, um, I had just had a, a child and I asked to go part time, which I was made pretty bad, really bad for asking in the first place because it just wasn't an option. And I went down to four days a week. Um, but I was sort of made to feel a little bit grateful for it. It wasn't done at all in the industry. And now to think some 15 years later that I'm operating as a senior underwriter on a job, sort of job, short, job share basis. It's just incredible. It, it's just so good to see. I think COVID played a huge part in that. Again, what wasn't thought of as being possible on the 22nd of March 2020 was all of a sudden very possible. And we were sent home as laptops. We were trading with our brokers very, very quickly, something that just hadn't been imagined before. So that's something that's, it, that has, has really changed. 
in terms of your question about uh, being for working mothers, I feel quite strongly about this. I'm a working human. I happen to be a mother. That's just one bit of my life. Um, I'm also very proud of being a mother, but it's just one bit of it. And the and the the life work balance that I get from the job share is is something that I I, I enjoy hugely. It's not just it's not just for for for, for mothers. Um, having said that, it's interesting. Emma and I are the only job share in the entire Lloyd's market. And I think the way to get around it, and especially can I, I can only speak about the insurance sector, is education from the top down. If more people did it, the fact that I mentioned we're the only ones doing it still amazes me. Out of the hundreds and thousands of underwriters there are, we're the only people doing it. And until you have really senior people advocating it and actually doing it, you know, you can't aspire to be what you can't see. So we sort of shout quite loudly about that. Thank you. So flexible working, you know, in its nature itself should be flexible, which means that these conversations will probably evolve throughout one throughout one's career journey. Um, so Katie and Alan, if maybe I can address the next question to you. You've requested flexible working arrangements with your employers at different stages in your career. So Katie, you when you were in your mid career and Alan much later in your career. So how can employees drive these conversations? And then what challenges do they face when they have these conversations with their employers? Thank you. Yeah, so I think for me, I was certainly concerned about how flexible work would impact my career. But I think it's really important that as individuals, I think, as you said, human beings, not just mothers, we start these conversations. The more we talk, I think the more we question traditional concepts. Um, and the more we start change and encourage a new way of thinking. I think many probably at mid-level might be concerned about their prospects or the reputation among their peers. However, I certainly feel my career has gone from strength to strength. Um, I don't feel like it's impacted me negatively. I think that's probably a societal concept rather than the actual reality. Um, I've definitely shifted my focus from a work busy to a work smart. I think I probably achieve a lot more in the four and a half days that I do work compared to the five I previously did. And it might seem like a really small change to finish at 12 on Friday, and it probably is. But for me, it's had a huge impact. Um, I think flexible work as well as for everyone and anyone at different stages of their career. And I think conversations like this hopefully show that. It's definitely not a one size fits all approach either. I think employees need to be given the opportunity to find what works for them. I think I originally started with flexi hours. Um, again, to your point, I looked at it from a mother's perspective and I was like, I need to do the school pickup, but I need to work full time. Um, and I've realized actually compressed hours works best for me because it's about me rather than my son as much as I love him, but he can do without me for a few hours. Um, and I think especially if employees can be vocal and proactive rather than reactive on these conversations, employees will naturally be encouraged to look at their options that they might not have thought were possible before. Um, specifically at Morningstar, I think recently we've been doing a lot of focus groups around career progression and we've certainly looked at um, different people in different stages of their careers and, and through that data we've seen common themes and I think we've seen the generational differences with that of what's important and I think probably to touch on what we've said before I think if we're we're looking at our future workforce millennia, millennials value work-life balance and I think I read somewhere the other day that 92 percent of people born between 1980 and 2000 identified flexibility as their top priority when job hunting. I'll pass over to Alan. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a lot of it has got to be based around trust and it is all about openness in the workplace. And I think there is more likelihood of that happening now than there was 10 years or so ago. The pandemic has, uh, has brought some of that about and also the openness about all different um, aspects, whether it's conversations around mental health, conversations around menopause, conversations around um, kind of suicide issues within particularly the financial services sector. So I think there's greater openness and with greater openness comes the opportunity of greater trust and it has to be trust on both sides. So the employer has to be able to trust that, that its employees are going to do the work that is required to be done to fulfill the needs of that business and the employee needs to be able to trust that the employer is going to recognize them for the work that they do, whether they're doing it three days a week, four days a week, at, in the office, at home, wherever they're doing it. So trust is, I think, a, a very big uh, aspect of all of this. 
And I think trust needs to be built from the top. So just a, a very, very brief kind of background to, to my situation. I was the managing director of um, Hunter Southall Aspire on the employee benefits division and had been for about 10 years. W was getting to the point where I was starting to feel very burned out, um, but I didn't want to leave the business and I didn't actually want to leave, leave my job. Within Punta Southall, we have a, um, a sabbatical policy. I didn't know anyone that had ever used the sabbatical policy, and we were quite a big business uh, back in the time. And I decided that one way that I could lead the business in terms of trust was to take a sabbatical. So it was an investment for myself, but it was an investment for the business as well. And I took 10 weeks out of the business, and I completely cut away from the business. So I set it up on the basis of, the business needs to operate without me. And you know what it did? Um, but it also then set a precedent in the business that, that was to say that someone at the senior level is prepared to make changes and is prepared to ask for changes, because I did have to ask, obviously, for that change. I, and I think it has resulted in other people um, feeling that they can come forward and request different changes in their working environment. So interestingly, both you and Katie have touched upon the topic of career progression. Uh, in the previous panel, there was a conversation around presenteeism and what does that look like? And I think one of the biggest fears that uh, both young and not so young employees um, think about today is concerns around career progression. So let's look at it both from the employee and the employer's perspective. So maybe Emma, if I can bring you into the discussion. Um, what do you think are the challenges that employees face when they have flexible working in place in terms of their career progression? And then maybe Debs, if you can provide an employer's perspective on how employers can actually invest in the development of you know, employees who have exercised flexible working to make sure that they don't lose out because of lack of physical presence in the office. Yeah, definitely. I mean, firstly, I'd probably like to say that, I mean, Yes, it can be seen as a barrier to progression, um, but again, it's all about perception and it definitely shouldn't be. Um, there's misconceptions around the fact, you know, we've talked about it before about working flexibly. Are you less committed? Um, do you care less about your career? Um, whether that be in a job share or compressed hours or part time. Um, and I'm so guilty of this. We used to, I mean, still do say, oh, you know, I only work part time or I'm only in a job share. Um, and when we started this seven years ago um, now, um, I was really guilty of probably almost saying, oh yeah, well, I, I actually only work part-time or I only work in a job share and almost didn't want to, uh, to kind of own up to it because I wondered whether I would be taken less seriously because of it. Um, but again, I think now, I mean, as we said, with COVID, kind of everything's flipped on its head. People are talking more about flexibly, whether it's hybrid, um, and it definitely shouldn't be a barrier to your career progression. Um, what I would say, I think in our position within the job share that we have, it's allowed us to maintain our career. And I use that word kind of consciously. It's not a job, it's a career. And we both feel very passionately about that. Um, I think we've been able to pursue other things outside work while still be committed to our career. But what it has taken is a lot of determination and motivation and kind of proof that it can work. And we've probably had to work a lot harder. But I think it also comes down to the individuals, whether you're working full time, you'll be concerned about your career progression if you if that's kind of in you and, and you care about it. So whether we're working as a job share, I would say we're kind of equally as committed as to anybody else and, and probably more so. Um, I'd say though we probably just have to push a bit harder um, because of it. Thanks, Emma. Um, and I think the thing to remember in all of this is for flexible working to be a success, it does need to win for both parties. This isn't, I mean, it goes back to the point that was made on the earlier um, panel about the sort of power, you know, swinging between um, organisation and employee. But actually where you're really trying to get to is that sweet spot where it's working for the employee, but equally it's absolutely working for the organisation. And part of that is really thinking then about what the employer can do to ensure that there is that development and career progression for those people who are opting to work flexibly. So there were three things that I would um, encourage an organisation to think on. I think the first thing would be absolutely review and scrutinize your own internal data. So have a look at those people who are working flexibly. Are you actually accommodating you know, their, their flexible work arrangement in terms of how you actually are measuring performance? Um, 
when you look at things like progression, if you look at the statistics on who is progressing through your organization and you compare those people who are opting to work flexibly with those people who aren't, are people sort of comparably moving through your, your process or actually is there anything that is hidden in, and sort of buried in that process that is weighing towards maybe one side, maybe the non-flexible workers more than the others in terms of success in that process. So looking at your internal data would be my starting point. My second bit is again, um, uh, a theme that got picked up on the first panel, which is absolutely about su supporting your managers. So your managers are often at the, the front line when it comes to things like development and progression. Um, I think Jenny very succinctly made the point that, you know, often people end up in a management position because of either technical or market expertise, not necessarily their man management expertise. So actually investing in what career development conversations need to look like and what that might need to, to look differently for somebody who's working flexibly versus somebody who's working in a more traditional manner. So really putting that in that input into your manager population. My third um, sort of tip or idea to, to focus on would be around if you are prioritizing flexibility truly you have that as an approach within your organization it's about having an executive sponsor who's going to get behind that and is advocating actively within the organization and that is backed up with case studies and with role models and examples like that we've got here so that people can see what is possible people are encouraged to be able to have a very open conversation about what the possibilities are in your organization So I love personal stories, and we have two best friends here as part of our panel. So obviously, this is the best panel. Uh, but I'd like you to share your story, um, obviously your career journey. Job share is not a very, um, I guess, popularly exercised flexible working option. Um, I have a statistic here to share. According to the Charter Management Institution, only 5% of managers job share. So there aren't really that many examples out there as well of senior managers who job share. You know, as you began your discussions and, you know, wanted to move into a job share arrangement, what were the challenges or the barriers that you faced in that conversation? And then obviously on the positive side, what are the benefits? You've obviously described a few of them already. Um, also, you know, we spoke about career progression. Can you share with the audience how that has looked like? So how have you actually grown in your roles despite job sharing? A particular role. Good background how it came about. We need some background as to how it came about. Um, so I had always been working uh, for our company in London since 2002 and Emma had been working in London up until a certain time and then moved to our Singapore office. So we hadn't actually been, we didn't actually really know each other that well. The Singapore office um, was closing down and Emma wanted to come back to London and so we started the conversation about whether she'd join our team for various reasons. It wasn't possible to join the team for a five day basis each. So we started talking about the job share. I had a young family, Emma had a young family, but actually I'm not sure that was really the catalyst to join the job share. So we sort of got our heads together and said, should we propose it to our manager? who's a great guy. And he was definitely not against it. Just said, oh, I've never, like you just said, I'm, I'm not sure we've ever had a job share as an underwriter. How will it work? We deal with our brokers on a daily basis. Will they understand when you're in? How will they know? People always come up with problems, don't they? Well, how will it work? How, how will you know who's copied in and who, what email? How will the brokers know? That's always the answer. How will the brokers know how to get a hold of you? So we sort of sat down together and discussed what we were going to do. And we spoke to HR. And for, interestingly enough, our HR people had to go outside of the industry to a civil service contract. I won't say anything about that. We won't be best friends by the end of it. Um, so that, that's sort of how the conversation started. And we put together a proposal to our boss who literally said, give it a go. And it was really interesting. Someone said earlier about how some of the problems have come that some people might not know the pressures there are and the benefits you get from flexible working. He was someone who was very supportive of that and said, give it a go. Let's get together in six months. And so we were like, oh, we can't miss an email. We can't lose anything. We ca can't leave on a Friday not knowing that everything's done. So that's how the job share came about. Did you want to pick up some of the answers? <laughs> and yeah, and I mean, credit to our boss for one, who at that time, and as well as our company, both of them could have turned around and said, this doesn't exist in the company. This does not in exist in the Lloyd's insurance market. We've never, ever heard of this before. Um, but yet they didn't, and they allowed us, like you said, to to kind of to 
put a plan together, think through things like how it would be, how it work within the team, you know, because you've got to think wider than just, well, okay, we kind of wanted it and it would work for the company, but you know, what, what, what's the wider implications for the team, for the company, for our brokers? Um, are we going to be adding more pressure to the team? And as Vic said, they ended up going to the civil service to get a contract for a job share to then say, well, this was what one looks like um, and allowed us to trial it for six months. And yes, yeah, some seven years later here, we still are doing it. And I think in a way, that's one of the one of the things that I'm probably most disappointed about is the fact that we are still the only ones that we know of in the insurance industry at a senior level that are that are doing it because we've almost done all the hard work, especially within our company. Um, I think there was definitely things that within the team we learned. We used to have our team meeting on a Tuesday. We both work um, three days each and have a crossover day on a Wednesday. And we suddenly soon realized that, again, for kind of visibility reasons, for maintaining kind of our profile um, and taking the job share seriously and the job seriously, we asked if we could change the team meeting to a Wednesday so that we could both be present for it, um, which again, I think has, has benefited us and the team. Um, but I think there's definitely concerns and the barriers that you talked about in terms of, would we be seen less because we were less in the office? We were only present three days each. Um, but we've kind of overcome that and realized that, you know, the benefits that the but both we get and the company get from it in terms of retention, retaining two people that potentially they could have lost, um, maintaining or, and how we've developed since that. I mean, when we started this, it was just the two of us. Um, we've now taken on an assistant who we've now managed. So our careers have progressed in terms of the management. Again, somebody said to me recently, well, you can't possibly manage in a job share. It's like, we've actually been doing it for about three years. So um, <laughs> it's good that you knew. Benefit. <laughs> she gets the benefit or disadvantage of having two opinions on everything. You know, Emma and I are very similar, but we're also very different. And so often, our assistant might come to us with an idea or, or a problem and, and we can chat about it. So two heads are better than one. So it's, it's, it's great in that perspective. And we learn so much from each other. And to have that absolutely true peer-to-peer -peer relationship with someone, I'm as invested as Emma as she is in me. That's quite rare. There's no competition between us. It's a healthy competition because that's the nature of our job slightly. But it's, it's wonderful to have that sounding board to say, I've got an idea. And hopefully Emma would say that's disastrous. Or no, I think it's quite a good idea. It, it, it's that total ally between each other. It's just been so amazing to have over seven years. And that sort of safe space to say, I'm thinking about doing this. And she may say yes or no. But my goodness, did we have to be motivated to make it work. And the idea of copying in emails at the beginning so that we didn't drop a ball because that would have been such an easy way for management who maybe weren't supportive to say look it's not working and again old brokers aren't going to understand they're pretty switched on they understood it didn't take much so that's bit that's just been the, the, the sort of practical side between managing a job share but our brokers love it they don't play each other because the temptation is to say oh they'll play you off against each other but they don't and it's and it's worked it's worked it's worked really well what i would add to that as well is that i think you know some of the challenges that we probably didn't even appreciate at the time was um, I was coming back from Singapore. I didn't know a lot of the brokers. Victoria did. And again, openly, I don't know quite how we worked out that I would do the beginning of the week and you would do the second half of the week, but it actually worked out perfectly because Victoria did know all the brokers, but she would say to her brokers, there is no point waiting till a Wednesday to come in to see me when I'm in because we're failing. We're one person. You need to go and see Emma as well. So it was that openness that you had and the kind of trust and communication that we have to have between each other as well like knowing that the days that i'm off which again kind of comes back to one of the benefits because somebody said to us recently well surely you're just two people working part-time and it's like well no it's completely different to that on the days that i'm not working i'm able to switch off and trust implicitly knowing that if anything comes in or if there is a problem or anything victoria will deal with it um, and it is one of the benefits that we've both allowed ourselves to have that kind of benefit of work-life balance of being switched off and, and not having to answer calls on days that we don't work. Carrying on from that, from a, from a professional development perspective, as underwriters, you can become slightly siloed that you see the same accounts year after year after year. You don't get a fresh pair of eyes. Last week, Emma was off and a broker ran me up and said, oh, Emma's quoted this. Can you do a requote on it? And it's something I haven't seen for six months. So it's really good for the business to have different eyes on different accounts you know, regularly and our own um, exposure internally. We, we were worried about that. People think, oh, are you taking your job seriously? Now you're only part time. But again, we work very well together, but also individually. Emma has different interests 
in, in various committees she does outside of the underwriting and I have different interests. So we have the best of both worlds. Which I know it sounds really cliche, but we can operate together, but also separately. And so I would really just say it's a great, it's not a problem we have, but it's a great solution to working. I think that's one of the key things, and we kind of touched on this earlier, that it shouldn't be a solution to a problem. It should be a viable alternative to filling a physician. And, you know, in terms of you talked about kind of, you know, fatigue, burnout, which is a which is a problem at the moment. Like, I'm not saying we don't have that at all, but the fact that we're working ha half the week, I say I was going to say only then, but not only. I've got to drop that word. Um, but, you know, Victoria comes in on a Wednesday, and even if I'm feeling a little bit out, full of beans, <laughs> exactly, and it kind of picks you up again, and it came and maintains that, you know, commitment, motivation, and kind of, you know, challenging each other, which I love as well. Like, the conversations that we have, like, you talked about the peer-to-peer -peer relationship, but we do challenge each other and push each other outside our comfort zones, um, which, again, is just because we want to progress as well and want to be the kind of best for ourselves as well as our company. Yeah. I'd go on all day. I know. <laughs> I'm going to stop. I'm going to... Talk people always say, oh, what's in it for the company? Again, if you have a single underwriter doing a role and they take a week off, that's a whole week where everyone else in the team has to pick it up. But we generally don't take holiday at the same time for whatever reason. So you fill that gap because you don't have, end up with that week with not someone's not there. And, and our job is very, very cyclical and very fast moving. We're a very transactional team. So you don't have that, oh, gosh, someone's away for a week. That's going to be a nightmare for everybody else. So we're able to spread the work around. So it helps the company in that sense. One last thing. One last thing. I was going to say. But what I would say it does need two kind of committed individuals to want to make it work and a supportive manager and a supportive team who we've had to get buy-in from as well to make it work. Um, because of all of that, as well as the company as well, has allowed us to, to kind of embrace this. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, one thing that you mentioned, Victoria, that really stuck with me was that you went to your manager with the solution of how job share would work. And I think that's a very important point. So rather than add a problem into your manager's plate, sometimes when you go with the proposed solution of how you can make flexible working work, that conversation can actually be quite constructive. And it might play out in your favor like it did in the case of both of you. So um, I think that was really meaningful to me. Uh, you also touched upon a point around mental health and well-being. Uh, were you sneaking into my question, Kat? <laughs> so that's actually my next question, right? With the pandemic and with the millennials coming in and actually opting for very different set of values and cultural preferences at employers, mental well-being uh, and mental health is obviously a topic that has surfaced in recent times. You know, there's a lot uh, of awareness building exercise that's going on and a lot of conversation and candid uh, talks around the topic. Uh, how does flexible working play into that? And I know, Alan, you obviously have a personal short, uh, story to share there. So maybe I'll start with you, and then Katie, if you can add your views. Yeah, thank you. So, so a couple of aspects to 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 that question. So, in terms of from a personal point of view, um, so I've already said I, I I took the time out. I absolutely did recharge. So this was in in 2018, um, 20, 2019. I, I was recognizing that th there was a real benefit from that time out and there was more awareness around mental health and well well-being. Um, so um, with, with our CEO, Steve, who's sitting at the back, uh, we decided we needed to be doing something about supporting employees within the workplace. So so we did the we did the tick box ex exercise. We had some people trained up as mental health first aiders. We referenced the uh, employee assistance program, all of that type of, type of stuff. But at the end of 2019, I felt to myself that we had only tick boxes, that, that we, we hadn't done much more than that. And, and I wanted to find a way to better support people in, in the workplace. And um, we, with a, 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 I put, pulled together a small group of people from within the business, and we were looking at how we could do that. And we looked out at, at providers of mental health packages and I felt that either they weren't the right cultural fit or they were too expensive or, or both. Uh, and, and so I decided that we needed to do something internally. And, and around that time, uh, I, there was some um, kind of uh, awareness week of some description. And I was thinking, well, well, actually, you know, what that does is focus people's mind on a particular topic. Um, over a particular period of time. And so what, what we decided to do was to start a program where every month we focus on a different topic. 
Um, we call that program, we now call it By Your Side, because what we're saying to our, uh, our, our colleagues is we won't have all the answers. We won't necessarily be able to do everything that puts things right, but we will be by your side in whatever challenge that you face. And, and we've, we've tackled some really, really difficult um, subjects. Um, and um, next month, as an example, we're, we're, um, we're covering stillbirth and baby loss. Um, and you know we're really careful at, at how we do this. And we were so fortunate because we kicked that program off in February 2020. So it was just timed perfectly because obviously we, we then went into to what we're all aware of. And to, uh, taking it forward a little bit, um, 2020, 2021, I then decided that I was in, in a situation where I now wanted to, to move away from that very senior role of managing director, but I still didn't want to leave the business. I was able to have uh, you know, a very forthright, um, open conversation with Steve to say, you know, I, I think now is the, the time that we should look to, for someone else to fill my, my um, role, um, but I don't want to leave the business but I do want to 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 start um, getting uh, ready for you know eventually leaving the workplace. So at the end of 2021, I stepped down as managing director. We had a three month transition period whilst I handed over work, and since April 2021, um, I've been working three days a week. It's hybrid as well, so I'm in the office or or, or at home or or at at a client's, and you know I think from my point of view, it's been fantastic. There was work leakage initially, but I've worked on, on you know with myself to not allow that to happen. I've worked within the business, I've worked within with, with Steve to ensure that that doesn't happen. And I now work three days a week with rare leakage into the other days. Um, and you know, I think in the round, it's created a culture within our business that means that other people are willing to come forward and share experiences. Some of the stories that we get and by your side from our colleagues is tr truly humbling. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. And I think I want to touch on a couple of things that you mentioned around like sabbaticals, mental health. And at Morningstar, um, I set up with a colleague of mine a Let's Talk series. So quarterly we have a mental health panel and it's different people throughout the business and throughout the EMEA region sharing their mental health journeys again really raw topics um and i think one of our mds our regional mds actually talked about how beneficial the sabbatical was again similar to you he was at a point of burnout and at a point of just walking away from everything and i think he had some really really raw conversations as well with our head of hr at the time about how desolate he was feeling and the sabbatical for him just really, really enabled him to fully switch off, um, really look at his priorities in life. And he came back and shared that experience. And I think that's one of the things that Morningstar we really try to do is to understand what place work has in life. Um, we're not saving lives. Sorry to break it to everyone. I think the world still goes on if I'm not in. So, and we really try to reinforce that. And I think again, like you setting examples and setting an expectations. So recently we've had our CRO, we've had a regional MD, we've had a head of international marketing, all go off on sabbaticals, totally uncontact un uncontactable, um, not spoken to anyone, not even cared to touch base, and really set that expectation and example of it's okay to switch off, it's okay to prioritise that mental health. And I think flexible working really does enable that, whether it's working part-time, whether it's job sharing, um, compressed hours. I think I touched on it earlier for my flexible journey. I think I had a real, maybe archaic approach to it as a mother and a single mother. I was like, right, this is all about me still pushing my career, me being there for my son. And I would log off early to collect my son, come back, do his dinner, still reply to emails when he was in bed, log back on. And I just still felt really pulled pillar to post and I wasn't giving either everything. And I think it was probably a societal thought in my head of I have to do this because I'm a mother and I'm a single mother and and that's what I should be doing and I really try to turn kind of the flexible work to focus on me um so as I said that finishing at 12 on a Friday might be really small to like a lot of people and at Morningstar they probably don't even notice but I go and get my hair done I just watch Netflix for a couple of hours and it's not about my son it's not about anyone it's not about doing the washing or anything and it's really really benefited my mental health as well I think I 
I'm a lot more focused, I'm happier. Mex um, Morningstar have been really supportive of that, but I think ultimately they've benefited as well because I'm a lot more productive, I enjoy my job again. And I think that kind of brings us back to a point that's been mentioned in, in both of these panels is that I think performance should be judged on productivity and output and not the archaic nine to six, Monday to Friday, you have to be at your, your desk. And I think if employers can adjust to this mindset and harvest a culture that enables this, it certainly will bring down many barriers of, that flexible work can potentially present, not just within the organization and not just within the industry, but in society as a whole, because I think there's a generalized problem that, that we have. And that's my two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great uh, conclusion as well. So uh, those are the questions that I had for you, and maybe we can op up, open up to the audience for questions. So any questions, anyone? Hi, this is actually a question uh, primarily for Alan. Um, post COVID or you know, in the return, we were all bashed for wanting to hang out at our golf courses and hugging up our homes and all of that. Um, to what degree do you think that you can share your experience as a way as a blueprint or framework, both for return ships of, of, or keeping that expertise um, and intergen intergenerationality in the workplace? Uh, sorry, I, forgive me, I didn't fully understand. So I just really, I mean, to what degree does your experience provide a framework or a blueprint that can kind of counter a lot of the biases around us wanting to hang out on our golf courses and not actually wanting, wanting to be part of the uh, ongoing economy or? Um, well, I mean, I, I think one of, one of the, the key factors in, in all of this is, no, is, is going back to what, what I said earlier about sort of trust, trust on both, both sides. So talking about it from a Punta Southall perspective, I, I think what we have created is a sense of, of, of trust and the ability for people to come to talk to senior people within the business about whatever it is that they're facing um, with the recognition that we as senior people wait may not have all the answers or may not be able to facilitate um, all of their requirements, but that we would do our best to support them as, as best we can. And, and I absolutely agree with the point that Devia made uh, about Emma and Victoria. I mean, so often as a manager, you get presented with a problem and you are expected to, to resolve that problem without perhaps any knowledge as to how to go about it. And it's so much more beneficial if someone comes to you with a problem and at least part of the solution. You know, what are they looking to achieve? And, and we definitely have that situation within Punta Southall. Now, we have many people uh, working in all different ways. So, um, I mean, most people will, will, will be working some days in an office, but it's generally the days of their choosing. Or, or there are team meetings set up where the requirement is there is a team meeting, you know, you should be attending that that team meeting. But we're trying to be as flexible as we reasonably can be. I, and and I did read some some time ago. There's um, I think I think they're called the the four day week model or something like that. But they they talk about a a, a sort of sub model to that 180 100. So what they're saying is 100 percent of money for 80% of the time are maintaining 100% productivity. And, and, and if you get that sort of trust environment, then I think you've got a, a good functioning workplace. Thank you. Um, just a quick question for somebody who has left banking after 38 years and there was no choice I'm just wondering on Illuminize, so people who've left, and we talk about people going into management that haven't got the skills, and yet there are people who've left the working environment because those options haven't been there to come back and support, yet that passion's still there. So retirement, as a saying, is no longer, I think, the retirement that I knew, that I thought I was, I'm probably more busier now than I ever was. But it's just a shame that my own organization hasn't taken the advantage of my gray cells of coming back as a leader, maybe helping them in those odd days to be able to help those young people coming in. What is leadership? If I have left 
you know, have no big teams. So when we talk about smart working, what about that gray hair that we have lost in, in the working world and inviting them back and helping support some of these uh, challenges that we're facing? No, well, uh, well I, I was the, the one thing I would say is let, let's try and not get them leave in the first place. You know, w w there is this talk, I think Julianne said, said about it earlier about the, the great unretirement of people returning to the workplace. Well, well let's have the conversation up front and, and see whether people actually do fully want to leave the workplace, you know, at that point, or is there some accommodation? That would allow them to, to to remain and be those mentors and and you know examples for the people um, uh, coming through. So I think that's the starting point. You know, let's not have them leaving in the first place if they don't want to. All I would add to that is that something that Emma and I have spoken regularly to our HR team is: could they please advertise all jobs as being flexible? So then I think it would just widen the net so people in that position would look at that job and not say straight away, that rules me out, but actually maybe I could do a job share or if it's off, if it's just advertised from the get go, because I think people are sometimes on the back foot. I really want the job. I don't want to start before I'm even there suggesting that I'm a shirker, which is what people think. So I think that's something that HR departments could do. Any other questions? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, Emma, Victoria, um, a question for you. And I don't think it's necessarily insurance. I've worked in many organizations and I've only ever known of one job share um, in the same way. So I don't think it's it's just an insurance issue. Um, why do you think it hasn't been? I mean, obviously, in your case, it's worked very well and it's been successful. Why do you think we we only hear of, you know, the odd one here and there throughout our careers? It's a great question. Um, it is a really good question. I think, I don't know whether it is because people feel that there is too many barriers in the way for it to make it work. Um, I mean, th there's definitely more stories about it being heard. And I think it's one of the things that we've kind of, like I said, even to start with, we were kind of embarrassed to talk about it or it was very much, oh, we won't mention that we're in a job share. Whereas now I think the only way that we're going to hopefully move the dial on it is the fact of it is education, it is learning, it is us kind of talking about our story and sharing it so that more people do hear about it um, and kind of sharing the message that it can work. I think it probably goes back to the tradition that job shares and flexible working were for women. And we are operating in a pool particularly in Lloyd's, where there are, I don't know what the split is, but it is definitely more men than women. So there just are less women senior underwriters of our age. So I think that's probably what started it. So we're sort of all fishing in a pond that was sort of set up 30 years ago. So hopefully as time goes on, we'll see more people doing it. I suppose people see it as a luxury. Can you afford, can people afford for that, if I'm being absolutely brutally honest? And again, all we can do is talk about it and hope that, I mean, the dream would be to see some men doing it. Just to get that diversity that's not not just the women doing it. But I think that's probably why. Yes, just one last point on that as well is that there is, um, because it's on an article that I recently read on about a job share, because one of the other things, again, in terms of career progression, and there is it a ceiling to our careers in the fact that we are a job share, and hopefully it's not, but some people could perceive it. But there is two... Um, humans, I'll say, but they are females, working as part of GCHQ, GCHQ as part of the intelligent unit in the most senior positions possible, showing that it can work as a job share as well. So again, it's just highlighting and educating on those stories. And the more we talk about it, hopefully the more it will, will change and that there will be more. Thank you. Um, I think it's funny what you said about the job description being put as flexible. I actually turned around in an, in an exit interview and said, you should not say that if it isn't true. So take it off your job descriptions if you don't offer it. Uh, we have time for one last question. I think there was somebody who raised their hand. Thanks. Um, I've got a question. Do you think that employees know what to ask in terms of flexibility? And the flip side is, Work, working flexibly and the flip side is do you think that employers are transparent enough anyone 
Um, I don't think employees are transparent. I think I mentioned it earlier. I think it needs to shift from a reactive approach to a proactive rather than someone kind of getting to their wits end or at a real point of burnout or anything and saying, oh, I'm, I can't juggle everything. I need to do this as not just employers or managers, but as human beings, we should probably be aware of what our peers are going through to, to a certain degree of what they're prepared to share. And I think, again, probably around training for managers, but when we're having those one to one, it's brilliant to talk about OKRs and it's brilliant to talk about targets and what are we doing, but are we asking people, how are you finding things? What do you need? And being really proactive in talking about flexibility. So have you thought about this? And I think you touched on it. Maybe people are scared around losing part of their salary and can't afford to. Are we talking then about compressed hours or working different hours that suit someone who can't work in the morning because they have a thyroid issue or a mental health issue that just doesn't enable them to get up and start before 11. But I think having those really proactive conversations then in turn allows employees to feel comfortable to ask for things rather than going off sick for 10 weeks because they're just at a total point of despair and don't know where to go. I think it, it's ownership on both, but I think employers being really transparent about flexibility rather than just having all these policies that no one knows about unless they ask, it's kind of pointless, isn't it? Well, that's what I was saying. <laughs> I, I would absolutely endorse that, and, and for, mo for most of my, my career, I've been working in employee benefits, and my principal point of contact will be HR teams and HRDs. And um, you know, one of the things I've seen consistently is companies that have sabbatical policies but hide them, so 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 people don't actually know they exist, and 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 then they wonder why people get get burned out and uh, or leave the business or whatever. You think. Well, if you put a benefit in place, then at least make people aware and promote it, because actually, certainly in my instance and in others, it's been hugely beneficial to me and ultimately, I think, the business. I think I'll just say one last thing. So I read, um, I'm trying to remember the stat the other day, so it's Harvard, um, it was a Harvard research project, and it said about belonging and employees feeling a sense of belonging at work, and that can be a whole magnitude of mental health flexibility. But I think looking at a global organization with 10,000 employees, having a sense of belonging and having a diverse workforce, which gives that sense of belonging, it reduced sick, sick, sick days by 75% and actually saved $52 million per year. So I think if we're just gonna talk about diversity, flexibility, and being proactive with that, those conversations in my head are free, but that saving is astronomical. Well, thank you for taking the time and sharing your thoughts on flexible approaches and the multitude of opportunities that they actually bring um, to individuals and to employers. Uh, based on the conversation, I was taking notes in my head, but I think three key things stood out for me. One was, um, I think for everyone to thrive and have a happy and committed workforce, it's very important that firms fully understand what flexible working entails. Uh, there was a conversation about this keyword trust. I think it's very important to build that trust with your workforce so that they can ask for those flexible working arrangements without fear of any negative consequences. And then um, lastly, I think role modeling, much like what our panelists are doing here, be role models in your firms so that people become aware of the flexibility that the employer is willing to offer. Um, and you can learn from what has worked or not worked for colleagues who may have exercised those options. Uh, as a call to action, I request all uh, member firms and uh, um, you know, members of other firms who are present here to ensure that flexible working options are made available in your organizations and that you have them role modeled within the firms. So to Alan's last point, if you are making something available, please talk and shout about it. These are good things. Um, I'd like to, uh, now like to invite our third panel on stage, which will be focusing on how we can demonstrate the value of flexible working in the future of work. Thank you. Thank you.